This evening, we're going to be concluding our study in expository listening. Um, and so if you didn't bring it this, w- with you this evening, that's okay. I know that we've been sort of jumping around and having um, some, some detours from it, some supplements to it, some little departures from it over the last several weeks. But this evening, we are going to wrap up the study in expository listening. And I hope that it has been um, for you as invigorating to... <laughs> It has been as invigorating for you as it has been for me in regard to, as, as we consider the responsibility that we have as listeners, uh, that when we come in from service to service, from Sunday to Sunday, from Wednesday to Wednesday, whatever that looks like, or conferences, we bear a tremendous responsibility of preparation. We, we bear a tremendous responsibility of accountability that one day we will give an account for the things that we've heard and what we did with those things. And so tonight, what we're going to be looking at is chapter 6 and the conclusion. And so chapter 6, if you've got the book with you, begins on page 85. And again, if you didn't bring the book with you, that's fine. I'm going to be reading several large chunks from it. Um, And the title of the chapter is Practice What You Hear. And then the conclusion, really just wrapping everything together, the conclusion of the book is listening like your life depends upon it. And I hope that that, in particular, that conclusion, that title of the conclusion of listening like your life depends on it, really helps us see the gravity of what it means to sit under teaching. What it means and the weight of responsibility that that comes with being a hearer of the word. And we're going to look at James chapter 1, that the the passage of scripture that the chapter opens with. Before we do, I want to read the quote that's on page 84 just before the chapter opens. This is from a Puritan by the name of Thomas Watson. And he had this to say, If you would hear the word aright, practice what you hear. Hearing only will be no plea at the day of judgment. Merely to say, Lord, I've heard many sermons. God will say, What fruits of obedience have you brought forth? The word preach is not only to inform you, but to reform you. If you hear the word and are not bettered by it, your hearing will increase your condemnation. We pity such as know not where to hear. It will be worse with such as care not how they hear. To graceless, disobedient hearers, every sermon will be a faggot to heat hell. It is sad to go loaded to hell with ordinances. Oh, beg the spirit to make the word preached effectual. Ministers can but speak to the ear. The spirit speaks to the heart. Now, before we go to James chapter 1, I want us to turn back to Jeremiah chapter 5. And and it's been within the last uh, several services that we've had here. I think it was Sunday morning where Pastor Philip brought us to this text. And it's the last two verses of Jeremiah chapter 5. And one of the things, if if you have ever taken any time to study the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, one of the words that recurs, that happens again and again and again in the book of Jeremiah is the word listen or hear. And it's the idea of, you guys are hearing all of this, but are you listening to it? You're receiving the, the audio waves are, are making vibrations on your eardrums, but what effect is it producing within your heart and then into your life? And, and Jeremiah confronts his, his listeners with that. We're not going to take the time. I, I thought about doing this, but if we were to take the time and look through in the Old Testament, the downfall of Israel as a nation, when they, when they split as a nation and the northern kingdom begins almost immediately to go into and follow idolatry, and the Lord sends prophets and sends prophets and sends prophets to them, and they will not listen. Then First Kings seven, or excuse me, Second uh, Kings seventeen is going to tell us why why they were destroyed, and an army, a foreign invader, comes in wipes them out, and who they didn't slaughter, they disperse all over the place. And the ones who they didn't disperse, they left in poverty and ruin in the northern kingdom. And when it comes to, in Second Kings chapter 17, to say why, it says because they sinned. They didn't listen to the warnings. But then when you come to the end of Second Kings, and you come to the end of Second Chronicles, and it tells the story of the remaining bit of the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Judah that was primarily the tribe of Judah, Levi, and Benjamin. When it comes down to say, why did this happen? The last pages of both those books will say the exact same thing because they despised the prophets. They didn't hear the word. 
Not that there was a shortage, not that there was some kind of... um, some kind of lack. In fact, if you, uh, I've done this with some of my Bible classes here at the school, and and I'll show them a timeline. As it gets closer and closer to the destruction of those kingdoms, the the number of prophets actually increases. It's not like there was a shortage of those who were proclaiming the word. There was more, and more dramatically. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, So many of the minor prophets. You have all of them, this sudden influx, right before the destruction of both those nations, you have the Lord proclaiming through these men, repent, it's time. It's even referenced here in expository listening on page 85. People in Ezekiel's day, they loved to hear it. It was a great show. They would show up to hear Ezekiel because, man, he was a wonderful speaker. Then they would walk away saying, wasn't that interesting? Didn't you like that illustration that he used? It was really vivid. Brought the message to life. But there was no transformation. But here in Jeremiah chapter 5, we have almost a parallel situation. Jeremiah condemns the people that are in his day, and he says an appalling and horrible thing, verse 30 of Jeremiah chapter 5. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. But what will you do at the end of it? And all through this chapter, there's proclamations. There's warnings from Jeremiah. And this is just the beginning. It's it's not from a shortage of sermons. It's not from a shortage of warnings. Instead, They just weren't doing anything with it. Jeremiah is going to prophesy for years and years to the point where he's going to cry out to the Lord and say, why why are you making me do this? They're not listening. There's no change being affected. And the Lord doesn't say, okay, let's let's adapt a little bit. Let's be a little bit more sensitive to to the people and, and give them a message that maybe they'll receive. The Lord sends him right back doing the same thing. Because the problem was there was no transformation taking place. In expository listening, if I slip up and say textbook, I'm sorry, I'm back in school teacher mode, it might happen. (sighs) On page 86, he's going to say this. About halfway down the page, in the middle of the second, par- the second paragraph, Herod and the Athenians were guilty of the same thing, of, of having no intention of putting into practice what they heard. And he gives the reference in Mark chapter 6, verse 21, and Acts chapter 17, verse 21. If you're not familiar with those, just to kind of brush you up on what's happening, Herod, uh, not the same Herod who was king when Jesus was born, but actually one of his sons, uh, the Herod that put John the Baptist to death, What was taking place in that situation? Herod arrested John the Baptist, but didn't want to put him to death. Instead, Mark chapter 6 tells us that he heard him regularly. We think through some of the other stories that the the scripture will hold like that, Acts, where you have Paul who for years is in prison before some of the the, 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 um, Roman officials. Felix and others. Paul's going to preach fervently to them. We have those sermons recorded for us in the book of Acts. And they say, that was good. You've almost got me. Almost, and and this is the King James translation of this, but almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian, Paul. Back to your cell. Mark goes a step farther, though, when he talks about John the Baptist. He talks about how Herod was sort of interested This is a righteous guy. Maybe he'll even work a miracle. Won't that be neat? For the Athenians in Acts chapter 17 that the author refers to on page 86, this is the uh, the Areopagus, Mars Hill. If you were here for VBS, when we had the VBS set up, that's, that's what that's in reference to. Paul, when he gets to Athens, he has... Uh, begins 
preaching as he sees the city rampant in idolatry, he begins to preach the gospel. And some people whose business it was, the book of Acts tells us in chapter 17, whose, whose favorite pastime was to hear something new. They say, man, you should come to our sort of arena where we have all this thought exchange. And so you can come and you present the gospel. And, and they were just interested in the novelty of it. They heard the apostle Paul preach. And some said, that's interesting. Let's have them back tomorrow. But others, the ones who were being transformed by that message, pressed in and said, we, we, we need to know more. Let's go with you today. Let's hear about this now. He goes on to say, some of you may never miss a sermon, but you fail to put much of what you hear into practice in your life. As your mother might have put it, simply goes in one ear and out the other third paragraph of page 86. He says, I'm sure you're familiar with the expression, practice what you preach. Those sitting in the pew must pew count on the one standing behind the pulpit to live out what he says. There's nothing more hypocritical and dishonoring to God than when a preacher doesn't do what he tells the con- congregation to do, but it's just as hypocritical and dishonoring to God when a congregation doesn't do what the preacher tells them to do. Man, that hit me between the eyes. He's going to say further on, on the next page, the bottom of page 87, he's going to say failure to apply a sermon isn't just lazy listening, it's sin. Beloved, when we come together and we hear God's word taught, when we sit under the preaching of God's word, if we just hear it but don't do anything with it, we're sinning. It's not just that we're missing an opportunity. We're sinning. Because we're hearing, thus saith the Lord. We're hearing, here is what the Lord intends for us to do. And if we don't do it, we're essentially disregarding and saying, "Mm, that's not for me, that's not now, that's I I don't want to do that. And And if we can look at the people in Israel, if we can look at... Herod, if we can look at the Athenians, if we can look at the Roman officials in the book of Acts and say, yeah, this is clearly a problem for them, let's not presume that it's not a problem for us. We do have to work to apply what we hear. Page 87 is going to go further to say that and essentially say we understand don't we, that, that preaching is just a means to an end. The goal, he's going to say this in, at the top of page 87, the goal of preaching God's word is transformation. It's not information. I can tell you beginning to teach here at the school, that was a real struggle to divide the two because I teach Bible. <laughs> My, when you teach at a school, you're teaching information. When you teach Bible in a school, you're teaching information and transformation. Because when I stand in front of my students, I don't want them to just know the genre divisions of the Old Testament. I want them to know Jesus. I want them to walk away from that knowing him. When we come to church, we ought to expect that we will not, and you'll hear this prayed frequently in our church, or don't let us leave the same way that we came in. Because there has not been hours poured over a text of scripture. There has not been. Let's make this clear and accessible to those who are gathered, to God's people, to say, here's what God's word says so that nothing happens. He gives a quote by an author, Jay Adams, in the middle of page 87, where he says, often, Listeners expect the preacher to do all the work for them. They expect him to apply the passage specifically to exact situations, answering all possible questions and suggesting various applications and implementations that pertain precisely to them. In other words, they expect him to do all the work. Selfishly, they forget there are other people in the congregation that the preacher cannot think solely of their particular circumstances. And there at the bottom of the pages where he says, failure to apply a sermon is not just listening, la- lis- li- lazy listening, it's sin. I- I've, I've had the unfortunate experience of being in other churches where 
one in particular, um, where the, the pulpit was, m many of us are familiar with circumstances like this where the, the pulpit was used as sort of the bully box, right? Um, where the, the man getting up to preach had an individual in mind that he had a bone to pick with that particular sermon. And I forget one of those particular circumstances. Um, very early on in my wife and I, I as marriage, we were there, we were aware of the situation um, and the pastor got up and abused the text horrifically, twisted scripture for the intent of driving a point home to that person who wasn't there that morning. And all through the sermon, I remember sitting there thinking, this, this isn't it. We wasted all of our time. We wasted all of our time. And no sooner had the service ended than people sort of started to huddle up. Man, too bad so-and-so wasn't there. Which takes us to one of the first points in this chapter. And one of the first things that we'll see as you turn to James chapter 1. The author of Expository Listening says this. At the bottom, be utterly teachable. I wrote next to that, be ready to be indicted. These sermons are about us. We're familiar with that, that old, I don't think it can be categorized as a hymn, but that old sort of song that maybe some of you sang growing up or know from years back, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer, very good. Do we enter hearing God's word that way? It's me. Not it's my neighbor. Man, I wish that person was here. It's me. Are we ready to be indicted? As we sit and listen, are we humble enough, and, and we'll get to that point in just a second, but are we humble enough to, to hear the word preached and not go, I'm fine. I've got this. What a, what a terrifying thing. We will be regularly from this pulpit by our pastor who, who is our preaching elder. We will be regularly called to examine ourselves. How foolish would we be to not bring our hearts into examination. James chapter 1, beginning in, beginning in verse 19, transitioning out of a section where he's talking about the goodness of the Lord and how we respond to trials as an evidence of our faith, he concludes that section, actually in the end of verse 18, where he says, in the exercise of his will, talking about the Lord, the Father, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. So he's just talked about how we are born again, how we are brought to life. It's by the word of truth. One commentator on this section said, by describing in the, the word in this way, James reminds believers that the word of God is not to be done with them after God uses it to bring about new birth. The word becomes a permanent, inseparable part of the Christian, a commanding and guiding presence within. The word isn't that just that which brings us to life. It is that which continually sustains us. And as he goes into this next section, he still has that idea of the word, not just bringing us to life at the, at the moment of conversion, but of bringing us to life throughout and sustaining us in our spiritual life. And he says this beginning in verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. 
Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he was like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Now we're going to walk through, with the help of, of this book this evening, this chunk of verses, but we're familiar with it. And I would caution us before we begin to walk through that, that we wouldn't, in our familiarity, become dull to what it's saying. I need this. We need this. In beginning here, one of the things that he points out in verse 19 and 20 as he he gives this exhortation of everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. The, The author of Expository Listening reminds us, and this is true, that church services as James would have been experiencing them, and James's audience, when this was originally penned, would have been experiencing them, were not necessarily like what we have on a Sunday morning. They would be a little bit more like what we have on Wednesday nights, where we say, okay, now you can interact. Where there would be, if somebody says, I don't like what you're saying, they had the freedom, and it would have been somewhat normal for there to be more interaction within the service. So if someone is proclaiming the word of God, and someone says, hold on, I landed on my front porch, and I don't like that. James is exhorting his recipients of this epistle, those who he is pastoring, albeit from a distance, he's reminding them, we need to be ready to hear. We need to be those who are ready to, as I already mentioned, ready to be indicted. Ready to confess that this is for me. I need this. Because let's, let's take this from a full biblical perspective. We readily, eagerly confess the Lord is sovereign. The Lord is good. The Lord is in control of all. We, we readily accept that. But that includes you being here on Sunday. God has so orchestrated the minutia of our lives that we're here to hear the word. Which means, there's something for me. More than that, Scripture tells us that it's the Lord who knits the body of Christ together. He's the one who puts the members of the body in the particular place. In other words, the body of Community Baptist Church has been organized by the Lord in His design. It's it's a really, I I love doing this, and, and, and for some of you who... Um, have, have spent some time talking with me, you, you know this because I've done it. Um, I love to tell about coming here to CBC. I love to tell about the circumstances that brought me here. I love to tell how the Lord worked in, in, in my family's life to bring us here at a particular moment and then gave us grace that we stayed here and that we are here now. We are so thankful for this place. And as I interact with a number of you, I get to hear those stories too. I get to hear about, you know, you know this is how we wound up here. And at the back of that, we see the Lord's fingerprints all over the place. Retroactively, looking back, we can say, and I see how the Lord was just bringing me here for that particular time, for this particular purpose. And then at the time, I didn't even know that, but here's how the Lord has worked in this. What that means then is the reason that you're at this church and not some other one to hear their message on Sunday morning is because the Lord has that for us. He's ordained all of that. Think even about as we walk through Scripture in sequential exposition. We go verse by verse, section, section by section. There has been seasons in the life of this church, and I've only been here for a little while, while the, the, this, uh, this practice of sequential expository preaching has been happening. But I've seen numerous times where this was not by design, And it probably wouldn't even have been inconvenience 
But the text that was brought for that Sunday applied directly to the circumstances of numerous people in the congregation. If Pastor Philip has shared on, on multiple occasions how people will come up sometimes, it's almost like you're listening to our conversations. Who told you about that, Pastor? How did you know that that was going on? It's just the next verse. Beloved, it's for us. We better be ready to receive it. Verse 21, he's going to go on and say, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. This goes back to the theme of preparation. When we come to hear the word, in the words of the author of this book, or are we purifying our heart? Are we coming ready, not just to hear with a recognition that I need this. The Lord has placed me here, placed that text on that pulpit for that service for me. But do we have things that are clogging our ears? Do we have things that would prohibit or at least slow our ability to hear? The last sentence on page 91, the author says this uh, at, the, at the bottom of the section of purify your heart. He says, purity is a prerequisite for receptivity. Some of what that looks like, as we've already seen in this book, so helpful, very practical things that we prepare the night before to come to church so that we're not fighting on the way. We think through leaving in a timely way so that we're not rushed and anxious and stressed and angry at the car in front of us as we're getting ready to, oh no, they turn on their blinker, they're coming in here too. It's happened to you, it's okay. It may look like we don't watch the news on Sunday morning before we come to church because I just, it just makes me crazy. It may be that we don't Check social media before we go in to hear God's word because ain't much good that you're going to find on there. It's going to help your heart be ready to listen. It might be that you guard yourself more, more carefully that there wouldn't be anything that would hinder you from hearing. Next, the author at the bottom of page 91 is going to say, humble yourself before the word. He quotes another Puritan on page 92, Jeremiah Burroughs. At the top of page 92, that inset paragraph where he says, to have a congregation lie down under the word of God, which is preached to them is a most excellent thing. God expects that you should submit your estates, your souls, your bodies, all that you are and have, to this word. And that is another particular of the sanctifying of the name of God and hearing the word. There must be a humble submission to it. In other words, there's not some off-limit areas in our hearing. Uh, he's about to talk about that, and we're just we're not going there. He's about to talk about this, and I'm just not ready to change in the He's about to tell me how I ought to do this. Well, he doesn't know anything about that. He doesn't know my experience, my life circumstance, my... As if we would declare certain areas off limits to the Lord, that we would compartmentalize and say, I will not receive instruction from the Lord's word in that area. The author of Expository Listening goes on to say, there's nothing better for our souls than to lie down under the word, to lay aside your pride and your resistance and let the surgeon of scripture work as it will. Beloved, we already know it's a fight. What we don't want is to engage in friendly fire. We don't want 
to be resisting the very thing that is better for us. At the bottom of page 92, the author continues, show the word hospitality in reference to the end of verse 21. Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. He, he talks about how this is welcoming language, receptive language. We won't take the time, but I would encourage you to read 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2 where you read about the Thessalonians and as they, Paul commends them for the way that they receive the word, for what it actually is, the word of God. Or the Bereans, they're commended. Like Eric's team during VBS was reminded, be a Berean. Why? They wanted the truth. They wanted to say, load it on. Give me that because I know what it can do, which is the very next point. What the verse concludes with, what verse 21 concludes with, which is able to save your soul. The, the author of this book says and entitles this section on page 93, Knowing the Gravity of the Word. This is why the conclusion of this book is, listen like your life depends on it. And where he's going to go with that, I, I would encourage you, read that. What he's going to say there in reference there is Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, where you have those who stand before the Lord, not as those who, like, like we're sending Craig and his family to in the, in, in the Finisterre Mountains. Not like that. Not those who have never heard the word, who've never had a scrap of scripture translated into their language. We're not talking about those people. That's not who's in Matthew 7. Who is in Matthew chapter 7 are a group of people who say, Lord, we, we know all the right stuff. We would confess all of the correct things. But the word never worked. When we understand what the word does, what the word's work is meant to do, We cannot approach hearing God's word preached casually. He goes on, the author goes on in page 94, listening is obeying. And he talks about the idea of we must be reactive to the word. It's meant to produce something. That's where James is going to go next. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And we'll, we'll unpack that just a little bit more in just a second. But understand, there's not a sermon that we hear that we're not meant to respond to in some way. And please understand, doing nothing is a response. It's just the wrong one. We absolutely hear and respond in every sermon. It's just a matter of whether or not we conform to the image of God that's been presented to us. And if this seems impossible, it's because it is apart from the Lord working within us. The Lord, by His Spirit, in conjunction with the Word, works within us to conform us to His image. This is what we've been saved for. Then we can't be content to just say, well, I've been saved, I've been redeemed, I've been born again. Like we talked about last Wednesday of be mature, grow in Christ. A newborn babe longs for the milk of the word. We have to caution our own hearts this evening and recognize and realize that there's a tremendous danger with thinking that we've become too mature to eat. We're still supposed to be growing. We're still supposed to be, to extend the analogy a little bit, metabolizing what we're taking in. And if we're not, something's bad wrong. It's a sign of decay and death. You'll hear verse 22 prayed here often. Lord, grant that we would be doers of the word and not hearers only. It's not just a nice epitaph that we'd like to tag onto the service. It's our earnest plea. The author continues, listening is loving. 
we could spend a lot of time here in this section. We won't. I know that we're moving rather fast, but uh, we're covering a lot right now. And, and most of you have the book. Please go and read it. But at the top of page 96, the author will say this. Right after the first sentence, at the top of page 96, in his farewell discourse to his disciples, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In other words, we should listen to God because we love him. If we approach hearing the word of God as optional, then we're approaching loving God as optional. And recognize so much of what James is doing in his text and so much of what the author in expository listening is going to be driving towards is the idea that our response to the word is a proof positive of whether or not we're in Christ. Because do we know what scripture says about those who hear the word and don't receive it? Those who hear the word and don't receive it are demonstrating that they don't believe it. I'm going over this with some of my classes here at school. That unbelievers, according to scripture, 1 Corinthians 2, Romans chapter 1, they lack the instrumentation to receive the word. It's foolishness to them that are perishing. They hear the word and they are unwilling and unable to respond to it. And beloved, that's where we find our heart. That's terrifying that we would hear the word and not say, I want to do that. And by the power of the Lord within me, his spirit in me, I'm going to pursue that. Because what the rest of scripture says, Romans chapter 6, many other places, that we have been given the spirit of God, that we would walk in righteousness, not in unrighteousness. We're to walk according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. We've been empowered to obey. He goes on and uses a great analogy, the, the, the author of the book, where he talks about the idea of somebody who hears the word. It's the idea of somebody who attends a lecture but doesn't, isn't a disciple of the lecturer. That's the idea that he talks about on page 97. And he talks about, and I've done this, it was a lot of fun, because you didn't have the work. He talks about auditing a class. Auditing a class. And Pastor Philip has used this illustration before. If we were to tell all the kids at the school, hey, doesn't really matter what you do, don't have to turn in your homework, we're not going to put in grades, but I want you to. I want you to turn in the homework. How many of them are going to do it? Maybe one. Why would they bother? If you've ever audited a class, you know that's great because all you have to do is come, sit, listen, learn, but you don't have the weight of what you learn being required of you. Beloved, we don't have that option with God's word. We're going to give an account for the deeds done in the flesh and we will give an account for what we hear. That's the sort of thing that is communicated and warned of continually in the scripture. We, we have a wonderful sermon that you can access on the website from, from Matthew where Jesus proclaims a curse over the cities that he had done most of his miracles in. Woe to you, to Beth, uh, woe to you Bethsaida and Chorazin because if the works that had been done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would be here today. They're going to rise up in judgment against you. Why? Because they had received more revelation. Those cities, Bethsaida and Chorazin, they had seen, they had testified, or they had seen and had testified to them so much about who Jesus was, and they were still rejecting, still uh, uh, not repenting. And the Lord said, it's not going to be good for you. And how much more so for us? When we have... We have the whole counsel of God available to us. We have sermons that we can stream 
uh, that we can download, that we can listen to, that we can turn on the radio. It doesn't matter where you are. You can find some. He's even going to comment on this, the author will, in, in, in just a few pages where he's going to talk about it. It's not so much the access to sermons that so many of us have to worry about. It's not even necessarily that there's so many bad preachers, though there are a lot, and that we just aren't discerning enough. It's that whether or not we're actually doing anything with what we hear. We don't have the option of auditing church, of just coming, going, and not one day having it be required of us what we did with what we heard. Our God judges righteously. And one day we will stand before him. And what will we say? We must be zealous to be doers of the word. A little bit further on in James chapter 1, in verse 22, where he says, But prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. The word that he uses there is, is really, really a good word. It's the idea of miscalculating. It, it can be translated very, very literally as like to miscount something. It has the idea of, yes, deception, but it's used in a reflexive way. You're, you're miscounting yourself. You're miscalculating yourself. These are the stakes there's a there's an element of this that I was going to get to later, but I'm I'm kind of jumping ahead in this section. <clears throat> I'm I'm kind of a very bottom line person uh, when it comes to just okay, why is this important? Which for some of you might be a little bit ironic because you know that there's lots of what seems like useless information that I know. <laughs> some of my friends in the back are nodding vigorously. But for me, there's value to that information. I, I feel like I, I can put that to use at some point. I want to know, what's it worth? What, what, what's at stake? And so often, that's just sort of, in my mind, it tracks this way. Uh, what are the stakes? Why is this important? Why would I need to know that? Well, what's at stake in not being a doer of the word? That's what James is saying. He's saying that we need to prove ourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. Well, the stakes are that in hearing, we would console ourselves to hell. Those are the stakes. That we would delude ourselves, that we've heard so much, we know so much, we've sat under so many teachings and sermons and conferences and podcasts and whatever, that we would miscalculate all of that hearing for actual transformation. That we would miscalculate our standing before the Lord because we've just, we've heard a lot. As I mentioned already, it's, it's, it's not the data dump. It's not just for information. It's for transformation. And if we hear continually and experience no transformation, we must, as Scripture commands us, examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. What James is dealing with in his letter, in this section in particular, is is the faith genuine? What he's going to move to immediately is what are the marks of whether or not we have genuine faith? Are we doers of the word? In, In sermon prep, uh, there's a story in one of the books that we were recommended here in our elder intern class. There's a story that the author records about um, sitting on the front row of one of his preaching labs, the author, uh, as he sat being trained how to be a preacher, how to be a teacher of, of God's word. 
sitting in the front row of his, his preaching lab would be the professor. And he'd have a great big cardboard sign that he would hold up during the sermon. And it would say very simply on it, so what? So what? Because we can talk about all kinds of information in the Bible. I can tell you lots about words. I can tell you about historical context and where it fits within the timeline of, of Scripture. And I can tell you all sorts of things. But at the end of it, by the end of it, I need to, and, and very often, and Eric knows this, Eric and I share our sermon notes. We talk about sermon prep together for our Sunday school class. Um, most times when I preach, I hand him a copy of my manuscript. And I've got a section usually titled in there, So What? If you've noticed, and if you haven't, now you've been tipped off. Most of the time when I preach towards the end, I'll say, all right, now so what? What does this have to do with us? What does this mean for us, CBC? Why? Because the, the idea is, the expectation is that this will not just be, wow, that was really interesting. The expectation is that this would, by revealing, here is the mind of the Lord on this matter. Now we do it. And just as legitimately as that professor could hold up the sign to his student and say, okay, so what? You've told me a lot, but what do I do with it? It would be just as legitimate for Pastor Philip on Sunday morning when he concludes the next section in Matthew 18 to hold up a sign and say, so what? What will we do? What will we do with what we have just heard? There's sort of a, a a language to this that some of us who've heard th- that that have heard Pastor Philip talk about this and some of the elder interns will talk about, and that hurt, but it was good. And we'll talk about, man, I don't know how to feel about that. And there's sort of a conflicting experience to coming away from a sermon where, yeah, I, don't, I didn't like that, but I, I, I know that I need it. But this extends into all areas of our life. This extends into all areas of what we might call the disciplines of grace, the practice of our faith. And on page 98, he, he's going to say something really, really bold, the author of Expository Listening. He's going to say something incredibly bold. In the last paragraph, he's going to say, not only is this, this idea of becoming a forgetful hearer, where after having walked through the next several verses in James chapter 1, someone who looks in the mirror, gets the idea of what they look like, what needs corrected, what, what here is not as it should be, sees themselves in that reflection, then goes away not having done anything about it, and thinking, I must be all right. The same way that we would look at that person and say, what's going on? We would say that that's foolish, but the author continues, not only is this a foolish attitude to have concerning God's word, but it's a dangerous one. When a person is constantly exposed to God's word, but doesn't respond properly to the truth that they hear, they put themselves at risk for losing what truth they may already have. And he's going to say something that, man, when I first heard it was just, wow. When I first read it, it's like, I don't, I don't know if I want to read that part. I don't know if I want to reference that part. But remember, we've talked about the gravity of the word. If you don't plan on applying what you read, then don't waste your time reading the Bible. Recently, my, my wife and I were talking about uh, one of the sermons that I had preached uh, on a Sunday night, <clears throat> and she said, you need, to, you need to be careful. You, you seem like you're hitting on the Bible reading plans a lot, and I don't have a problem with Bible reading. I think they're actually super helpful. <clears throat> Bible reading plans, um, the structure, having a plan of I'm reading this and this, and I know I'm planning on reading through this book in this period of time or whatever. But my concern would be that we would read to read that we would read without any plan, design, or an intention of being transformed by what we read. That we would mark through, check through, and say, yes, I've read through the Bible this year. 
and I know God not anymore than I did at the beginning, but I've, I've got an awful full reading plan. That ought to terrify us. When, when, I, when I meet with folks in discipleship, when I, when I sit down with somebody and say, okay, what are you reading? I, I don't typically expect you reading, you know, three chapters a day, one chapter a day. I don't have that expectation. I just want to know that they're reading and they're learning because the next question is, okay, so what are you learning from what you're reading? What are you doing with it? Might just be a couple verses. As long as we're interpreting it right, as long as we're heeding that well, great. But the author is going to continue saying this. If you don't plan on acting on what you hear in church, then don't waste your time going. Not only are you just wasting your time, but more importantly, you are heaping judgment upon yourself for neglecting the word of God. Every time you hear the word of God preached, you are training yourself to either obey or disobey God. Underline that in your book if you haven't. Whenever we hear the word of God without planning to obey it, we're training ourselves to disobey God. We don't want to be callous. We don't want to be that, because please understand this. Resistance in our conscience to little sin leads to larger sin. And I hate to use terminology that way because there's no such thing as little sin, but you understand what I mean. We've talked about it in, in Wednesday nights in a series some time ago, Respectable Sins. What starts as, let's just gossip. It's just discontent. It's just a little anger. It's just a little frustration. It's just a little anxiety. Everybody has anxiety. What starts as a little sin becomes easier and grows into a larger sin. It grows into unfaithfulness. It grows into distrust. It turns into discouragement. It turns into all sorts of other things. The author continues, the scariest thing about listening to God's word without applying it, it is that your heart will eventually become hardened to it. That's not the people we will be. I, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that as, as I prepared for this evening, as I considered what I would be looking at what I'd be sharing from God's word this evening. I was encouraged by reflecting on who we are as a church. Because while this always is a struggle, I don't think it's something unusual. I don't think that there's too many of us sitting in here, if any, that are sitting in here this evening going, wow, I didn't really know that I had to hear and do something. We know this. This is just the reminder. This is just the reminder that we, we all need. That we cannot come casually to listen. That to do so is to callous our heart, callous our conscience, callous our lives to the word of God which is able to save our souls. In the final section, in the conclusion, page 102, there's one more quote by Thomas Watson. <clears throat> you must give an account for every sermon you hear. The judge to whom we must give an account is God. How should we observe every word preached, remembering the account? Let all this make us shake off distraction and drowsiness in hearing and have our ears chained to the word. That's a great picture, isn't it? Have our ears chained to the word. There's so many other good things that we could walk through from this book, from this text in James. James. 
the author goes on in another section to say, while we might forget the sermons that we hear, God does not. In other words, when we stand to give an account, it will be against a perfect array of evidence. And what will we do? Our standing is by grace. Praise the Lord for that. Because all of us, all of us are miserable in this area to some extent or another. There's none of us in here that's not a wretched sinner. None of us. Who must daily cry out for grace and strength to be preserved, to be obedient, to be pursuing righteousness. But it will take work. It will take labor. This is the perfect conjoining of God's design in these things. This is the perfect design that God in his grace enables us to do what he's commanded. We're to be doers and he's given us the grace to do it. On page 110, the final page in the main content of this book. One more Puritan quote, David Clarkson. I'm just going to read that section. It's the inset paragraph on page 110. Hearing is the provision made for the soul's eternal well-being. Its everlasting welfare depends on it. If you fail here, your souls perish without remedy. For salvation comes by faith, and faith comes by hearing. It is an act of eternal consequence. According to our hearing, so shall the state of our souls be to eternity. Beloved, how we hear, how we respond, how we do what we hear demonstrates the liveliness of our faith. It demonstrates, it reveals the liveliness of our faith. Let's prove ourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers only who delude ourselves. Let's pray for grace and strength to not just hear, but do. Like our life depends on it. Because it does. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's no area of our life wherein we do not continually need you and need your sustaining grace and your mercy and your provision. And God, consistent with your character, being rich in mercy and love wherein you have loved us, you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And Father, with the apostle, I would pray that we would be strengthened to lay hold of, strengthened to apprehend what is ours in Christ Jesus. That we would be obedient to your word. Father, that our hearts would be indicted, that we would investigate, that we would examine, that we would hold up to the light of your word, our hearts. That we would repent of callousness and casual hearing and that we would endeavor and labor and make provision in our lives, in our schedule, in our habits to be doers of your word. Father, we pray these things for the sake of your name. As your people, we pray this in the name of your son. Amen.